Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this solo video, we are going to the city of St. Paul, Minnesota, to, to look at a story, my friends, that is... It's got like equally as bizarre as it is baffling. This is the story of the Ferguses, uh, of secrets, of lies, of betrayal, and of a mysterious intruder who may or may not have existed, and then at the end of it, you got one of those big old huh, whoops, <laughs> wink, wink. This is the story of a person without a plan, but they they called a lot of audibles at the line of scrimmage. It's got a lot of twists and a lot of turns, so you know what that means. Let's give it a go. So St. Paul is where we are going in this old one. That is the capital of Minnesota and it makes up half of the Twin Cities along with its sibling Minneapolis. It's home to over 300,000 people and is considered overall to be a generally safe city. Safer than its twin, except those winters. I, I wouldn't be putting up with that now myself. Though people posting on Niche.com would probably disagree with what I just said, with one person stating I'm here for schooling and it's noisy with constant shootings. And also potholes kind of get mentioned again and again and again. So the takeaways from that are obvious. Guys, stop shooting the roads! So this old one takes us to the year 2010, back, back in the day, to a house that was like right smack dab in the middle between Minneapolis and St. Paul. You're really asking yourself, are you coming or are you going? And it was on West Minnehaha Avenue. Don't let the name mislead you. There's not, there's not a lot of ha-has in this story, folks. There, on a street that's about as American looking as it gets, lived the Ferguses. That was Nick and his wife, Heidi. In the April of 2010, Nick, 27 years old at the time, and Heidi, 25, were happily living in a house in St. Paul. They bought their first home in 2007 in this nice, quiet neighborhood, having been married for a little over four years. They met where else but church, you know, having a bit of an out pray, they locked eyes. Nick, he worked in um, upholstering. Um, your dog pisses on the carpet, he'll fix it for you. It was the family business while Heidi, she worked for Securian, a financial services company. No kids yet, but they were young and the little ones were probably on the way. So you got your regular happy ass couple, nice neighbors by all accounts. They went to church, they paid their bills, they lived a simple life. Sure, why wouldn't you? So with that being the kind of people they were, the events of a Sunday in April 2010 were made all the more shocking. Early that morning, just before Nick and Heidi would have been getting up out of bed that spring day to go to church, well, a very different series of events would transpire. And it started out with two 911 calls made at 6.31 a.m. Now, the two calls were made, but both, you know, they hung up as soon as the operator picked up. Then, less than 30 seconds later, a third call was made from Heidi's phone to the 911 operator. And she said over the phone, someone was trying to break into their house. Hey, patrol 911. Someone's trying to break into my house. What city are you in? St. Paul? I'm in St. Paul. Hang on just a second. The call didn't last long, and Heidi sounded very, very scared. She was breathing heavily, and she just gave her address on Minnehaha Ave when there was a bang and a scream. Mini ha ha, someone's trying west. Somebody's trying to break in her house. Okay, what phone number are you calling from? Well, I don't know where she went there. 651 911 tried to call her back twice, but the calls went straight to voicemail. Officers were already on their way at that point, but then another 911 call came in about a minute later. It was Heidi's phone once again, but this time it was Nick on the line. He said someone had broken into their house and both him and Heidi were shot. Nick sounds completely hysterical. Okay, are you in St. Paul, sir? What's the, what's the problem? Well, I've been shot. Somebody broke into their house. I've been shot. You've been shot? Yes, please. Okay, stay on the 
the phone with me, okay? Okay. What's your okay. name? What is... No. Nick? No. Nick? No. Stay on the phone with me. Who shot you? I am a son broke in that house. No! Okay. Stay on the phone with me, okay? Do not hang up. The police arrived while Nick was sobbing on that call. At the house, the front door was slightly ajar and entering the home, calling out, they could smell gunpowder in the air. As they walked in, they found Heidi lying on her back in the kitchen. Her feet pointed towards the door. She had blood in her hair and on her face. She was already gone. Nick was beside, sobbing uncontrollably. He had been shot in the leg and on the ground nearby was a shotgun. Nick's shotgun. The door, the bottom of it was covered in pellets from a shotgun round. Nick was taken to the emergency room. Nick said that while they were waking up early that morning, uh, one, possibly two, people broke into, the, into their home. It was an apparent burglary. Nick, he, he woke up, he heard noises coming from the front door, down the stairs, he went, he got the shotgun out, lock and load, and then they, they, him and his wife, Heidi, they tried to escape, uh, escape the house, which, you know, was the right thing to do, just get out of there. They were, they were going down the stairs, and they were trying to make it out to their garage, where their car was, so they could, they could flee the home. When, as they were walking, Nick, he got jumped by an intruder, they wrestled over the gun, this guy was able to overpower Nick, reef the shotgun off him, Heidi was shot. Nick was shot. Nick wasn't able to give much of a description of the person who shot him, and he didn't see the other if there even was another person. The front door had tool marks on it from, from someone breaking in or attempting to, to break into their home, and Nick was treated in hospital. It was a minor wound though, a mere flesh wound, and he was released after just a few hours. In the meantime though, the police were of course you know, canvassing the neighborhood to see if anybody had seen anything, anybody had heard anything early that morning when two shots rang out and one woman was, was murdered in her own home. If you start coming here and try to see how much one do you want? What, the low one or the high one? Or? We'll go the high one. All right. Thank you very much. So you, want anything, you want anything to drink or anything? Or? I think he's working on that. Just a bit of water for me. All right. Just, uh, oh. There you go. Just put them right here, okay? Yeah. <laughs> you getting any pain meds? Not yet. Okay. Right. Nick, I'm Sergeant Gray. The other gentleman was Sergeant uh, Wright. Okay. Well, both. Uh, you said it was gray. Gray, like the color. And then uh, Sergeant Wright. W R. Yeah, right and wrong, yeah. Nick was then taken to the police station and was able to give a more thorough account of the events that morning. The events that led to his young wife's death. The night before, they chilled out at home, they watched a flick, Avatar, had a glass of wine, nothing happened really, the night before. Then, Nick woke up at about 6am, which was normally when he got up for work, so he was used to, that was his biological alarm clock, he got up, he was a bit thirsty, he got a glass of water, he went back to bed. As he was starting to drift off to sleep, once again he heard the door rattling. You're sleeping, mm -hmm. and then what happens next time? Well, because I get up for work about six every morning, yeah. I kind of got up, but we didn't need to be up until about nine to go to church. So I got up and went and got a glass of water uh, from the bathroom. Okay, so you woke up at what, what time? About 6 a.m. Go back to sleep, but just kind of fitfully sleep for 10 or 15 minutes, and then I hear our... I heard the screen door open. And like, what are they doing? Are they just going like this? Yeah. Kind of like that? Yeah, just shaking the knob and okay. shutting the door. All right. 
So what I did is I, I grabbed my shotgun out of the closet. Okay. And then I wake up Heidi. Okay. I said, hey, somebody's fiddling with our knob and trying to get into our house. So let's, let's get your shoes on and let's go out to the garage. Let's get out of here. And so I said, call 911 and then let's head to the garage. Okay. All right. So who, she called 911 then? She called 911. Okay, that's right. He got up, he got the gun, he woke Heidi, they started making their way downstairs. Heidi called in the police when, just at the front door, the guy broke in, wrestled with Nick. And as him and this guy were struggling, the gun went off, hitting Heidi in the back as she was trying to run away. So you guys come down the stairs, because the stairs are... So you come here. You come down this way. You turn left. Yep. She swipes her wallet off the console table. So like the console table's right here. Perfect, yeah. She grabs that. And then beelines it to the... As soon as she grabs it, yep. the door opens. Okay. And so I have my gun on my left. Yep. And so I try to shut the door shut, but it gets forced open. And the guy that was there, I think he saw it. Yeah. And he, I think he, he grabbed the barrel. And like down it. towards the trigger or more towards the top? Yeah. What would this guy look like? Is he a white guy, black guy, Asian guy? I think he was a black guy with a dark... Put it sweatshirt that was drawn. I, if I remember right, it was drawn up pretty tight. Yeah. But I did not get a good look because I was looking for Heidi. Yeah. And trying to wrestle the gun away so we could bail. All right. I don't remember exactly what happened, but the gun went off. So my fingers slipped under the trigger. You and I are like this. Yeah. And then the gun goes off. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it goes off down. Yeah. I, I mean, I know it hit Heidi. I just I know it did. Okay. I know it. Did. I don't know where it hit her, but I know it. I know it. Did hit her. Her chest the back she was in the she was running away so he definitely hit her in the back hit her in the back yeah okay all right the back her back or the back of her head um i don't know mid it wasn't low i don't i don't think it was a high shot but it was take your time it's okay did she yell or anything like that yeah and she went straight down okay did she fall face first or yeah okay all right so you and this guy are still Stamping and lit in the foyer? Yep. Okay. I grabbed on my right and pulled okay. that, and that's what went off the second time and hit me in the leg. So you shoot yourself then, or is this? I don't know if it was me, myself, or if it was the guy. I, I don't, I don't, I honestly don't remember at that time. After you get shot, what happens next then? He, he's gone. He takes off up the I, I fall down. He's gone. All right. Now, are you bleeding a lot, or? I don't even know. Okay. I don't know. Um, I just, I know I, I fell. I, I got to Heidi, and I started just I had to redial nine one one and just started I just you grabbed her phone? Yeah and I just I just started freaking out. A neighbor did hear some gunshots that morning, didn't see anyone out there looking at the window, and dogs were brought in, but they didn't find any scent of who this intruder could be. But you haven't had any problems though with other nope break ins, burglaries, nothing like that? Nope, nothing that I nothing that I can confirm or anything. There wasn't really much evidence though to, to go off. I mean, the way Nick was telling the story, the intruder barely got into the house. They, they barely got through the porch before they encountered Nick, they jumped him, then they booked it. And of course, the usual questions were asked. Nick was questioned, you know, was this, gotta ask, inside job or anything? You know, sh shooting my shot. You guys uh, have any problems with like that? Just the normal, just the normal stuff. Like, uh, you know, stresses about finances and quality time. And Every guy's got needs and urges, concerns, how you want to put it. Are you stepping out at all by chance? To other women? Yeah. No, absolutely okay. not. All right. Nick, I, you know, part of you wants well, to ask you this question. Did you have anything to do with this? No, absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. All right. Why is there a party that wants to ask that? Well, Nick, I'm a police officer, okay? Yeah. I gotta ask, I gotta ask the tough questions, all right? And that's a you know that's a, that's a tough question I gotta ask. You know, there's no there's no easy way to do it. You know? He said he loved Heidi. There weren't any side pieces, and there was no history of violence. I mean, as I said at the top, there there were nice there were nice lovely young couple. They were both heavily involved in the church. They both ran their own youth groups. If there was anything, it was that they were maybe just a little bit behind their bills, just like a tiny bit. That's it, really. Well, by a little, I mean like like. A lot. Literally the very next day after this incident on the 26th of April, they were about to be evicted from that house. You guys aren't behind in the bills or anything? We are behind in the bills. Um, 
which is a little stressful. In fact, we were planning on moving tomorrow. Uh, moving where? Well, we hadn't figured that out yet. We were, and, and this is a, a hard, it's a hard place for us. Uh, we were foreclosing on our, we foreclosed on our house. Okay. We have to be out by Monday. It tomorrow. They had purchased that house back in 2007 for $215,000 with two mortgages. The last time they made a payment on either of those two mortgages was in September 2008, a year and a half before April 2010. Nick had been served with foreclosure documents one year before, and in June 2009, the house was sold at auction. So they were being evicted from this house. And in fact, they were supposed to have been evicted earlier in April, but Nick, he contacted the law firm that was essentially, you know, uh, saying that his grandmother, she was in the hospice, she was dying. And so the eviction then was delayed until April 26th, the day after Heidi was killed. Now, uh, that was a lie. Neither of his grandmothers were in the hospice at the time. And in fact, both lived true 2010, so. So as I said earlier, they went to church, they paid their bills, they lived a simple life. Only one of those things was true. They also owed a fair bit of money to the bank, about 20 grand. So you, you and her never mentioned this to either, either set of parents? None of our parents are none of our friends. No one knows about this except you and Just, I. So, and Heidi. And Heidi. That's right. Okay. But there was no indication Heidi was aware of any of this, of their house being foreclosed and then them being evicted, of the debts they had, that their mortgage had been paid in like almost two years. I had no indication of this at all. In fact, she was telling friends that, oh yeah, we're thinking of moving. We're going to sell the house and probably move somewhere else. Heidi having no clue, they had no house to sell. In fact, she was contacting Nick and said, hey, we should probably go see the realtor soon, right? Sell the house. Nick was like, oh yeah, we will. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll do that soon. All right. Yeah. All information about the debts, the creditors, the everything, it was all in Nick's name. Heidi never signed a goddamn thing. Everything went to Nick, and he was keeping that pretty close to his chest. And all of this was evident to the police when they arrived that day, that Heidi was completely unaware of what was really going on. The house was not packed up at all when they were due to be moving out to be kicked out, getting fucked out of the house the very following day. I've moved out of houses before and I've helped friends move out of houses before too, Nick. It just seems like you're kind of, you know, putting yourself against the clock. I mean, if you're, yeah. if you knew, if you knew this train was coming, you know, you kind of get ready for it. Yeah, you know? I think a, par a part of it is just, for us, a significant part of it is the shame of the whole thing. Didn't seem like Nick was going to be going along with this eviction. Un but, luckily, unluckily, there was a tragic incident and, you know, that, that kind of went away at least for the time being. Nick was released by the police and Heidi was laid to rest. After which a sketch was done of who this attacker was. So police were a little bit curious about old Nicarino and his, his story. Um, well, for a start, nobody saw anybody out in the house early, you know, running around the neighborhood early that morning. The dogs didn't trace anything. And money troubles can often lead to bang bang. But also in this case, Nick said he heard jiggling like from the door and that was what startled him and led him to believe that somebody was about to enter the home. Must have been very loud though. And the police wanted to see if that was even remotely possible to have heard what he said woke him up. Six sixteen in the morning, April 27th, 2010. All right. Um, I'm at the front door, so let me know when you guys are ready. I'll, I'll try to knock for 15 seconds then. Okay. Here we go. We're in the bedroom looking at the hallway. What time is it? Did I get you? It's 6 1 6 a.m. 6 1 6 a.m. We are ready. But over time, the hunt for this guy remained and went nowhere. The case, it, it went cold. Like cold, like straight out of the oven into the freezer cold. Every year, the sketch would be on the news and time passed. 
A St. Paul family spent the last four years praying police would find their daughter's killer. Now they're asking the public for help. 25-year-old Heidi Furcus was a youth group leader who met her high school sweetheart and eventual husband in church. Police now want to talk to her husband again, but they say the husband doesn't want to talk to them. Four years ago, someone killed 25-year-old Heidi Furcus. Her family and police are still trying to figure out who. There was more to the story. According to a search warrant, the Ferguses were in financial trouble. It says Heidi didn't know they were being evicted from their house the next day. Then, later in 2010, according to police, Nick Ferkus told them to stop calling. I would say that's a little bit more abnormal than what we typically deal with. Now the case is cold. Police say they need a break, and the break could come from another conversation with Nick Ferkus. And we know there's someone out there, at least one person, if not more, that knows exactly what happened. We hope to talk to Ferkus too. We didn't have any luck with two different addresses or a phone number we found listed for him. So far, he hasn't replied to a Facebook message we sent him either. Police are not calling Ferkus a suspect, but they are saying they want to talk to him or to anyone else. Who knows what happened? Nick, he met someone else. He remarried. He met Rachel Watson, and in August of 2012, they married. They had been together for only a year, and they were head over heels with each other. Nick, you know, coming out of surviving an unimaginable tragedy. Rachel herself, she she had been married before, but it had been an abusive relationship, and so they met, and they could heal together. Very cute. Nick and Rachel, they would have three children together, and to, they would move into a house that Nick's parents bought for them. Nice. Can can I get in on that? So they lived there. I mean, okay, yeah, they were paying the mortgage back to Nick's parents. Um, Nick couldn't exactly get a house himself. His credit wasn't too kind of, uh, you know, kosher. But Nick would pay, you know, the property taxes and everything himself. And Nick, you know, he still had his job. I mean, the, the job he worked for, that, that upholstery cleaning company, it was a family company. He eventually would pay back everything he owed. And so things were good. You know, tragedy had struck poor Nick Ferkus. Things were, things were bad, but it seemed like things were, you know, the sun was shining on him once more and he could be happy after, you know, the trauma. And then Rachel started finding letters. Letters like uh, they hadn't been paying their property tax at all and that um, their house was going to soon be foreclosed. Sound familiar? The fact was that Rachel now knew Nick was lying and things started mounting. She knew he was lying about small things. She would find receipts items around the place. And Nick would lie, saying, oh, no, I didn't buy that, you know. And, and, and so she began thinking, well, if you've lied about the small things that you have no reason to lie about, what else have you lied about? Have you lied about the big things, too? That's when Rachel began to think. This is Because, I mean, the whole thing about, you know, Nick and Heidi being behind on their bills, that was even in the papers at the time when Heidi was killed. So Rachel, seeing this sounds very familiar, she took the kids with her. She left Nick. Now, new investigators, they took over the case, and they thought it odd, worth, maybe worth re-examining. For example, if there was an intruder breaking in that day and Nick had a fully loaded shotgun, hunting shotgun, he tells a story that Heidi went down the stairs first. So you going first down the stairs or is she, is she behind you or is she in front of you or what? Um, she's in front because I'm kind of trying to move her along quickly. Yeah. And then I'm right behind her. Yeah. Why would she go? Uh, is this like Operation Human Shield? In the 911 call, apparently Nick and this intruder were struggling over the gun literally right behind Heidi. When in the background, you can hear nothing. In fact, Heidi doesn't sound like, she sounds scared. She doesn't sound like, oh, my husband and some strange guy are fighting two steps behind me. Mini ha ha, everybody. Mini ha ha, someone's trying west. Somebody's trying to break in her home. She just sounds terrified, but not horrified, if that makes sense. The FBI, they did a digital analysis of the scene. Nick said that when he was struggling with this guy, the gun went off at chest height, hitting his wife. But from the angle of Heidi where she was shot, it must have been like at shoulder height, as in someone was aiming the gun at her. Maybe somebody who would have been following Heidi. Oh yeah, I'll be right behind you, following you out right now. And then, I mean, you've got a guy whose literal job, who specialized in cleaning up. He might be, you know, pretty good at, uh, you know, an old crime crime scene arena getting rid of that the lies that nick told rachel were something that like she too and this is completely separate to the ongoing investigation that she too began to think think about heidi about what really happened to heidi she wanted to know if there was any maybe fibs he told about his dead wife she confronted him about it she recorded the conversation i could get through this if it was just the lie i really could the problem is the heidi stuff 
That's my problem. The problem is I don't 100% believe you. I know it's shocking for you to hear that from me and it's shocking. Trust me, it's shocking for me to think it. I don't know what's correct. So I didn't actually understand what you were saying. But the fact that you're saying it is so indescribably jarring to my soul that I, 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 I can hardly read. I don't know what it is, Rach. It is too traumatic. And I don't know what else to tell you. The fact that you're lying was so easy for you to do in front of me over and over and over makes me think that, I could burn my life. that you could lie about something. That I could burn my life. Yes. There are a hundred things going through me like that. Are you wanting to say more? I'm probably not. Nobody will open to this conversation. I just can't do it. Rachel and Nick would divorce in the year 2018. Nick loved to live on big ass shoes, fancy dinners, trips, buying this and that and these. You know, I, there was any was money in his pocket. Well, money was burning a hole in his pocket. So he would immediately spend it, not pay his bills, borrow more. Heidi, she left all the money shit to Nick. She didn't know. Rachel, the exact same. She left all the money stuff to Nick, but she soon found out. It's kind of amazing that there's actually no life insurance though in this one. I was kind of, when I was researching into it, I was a little bit disappointed. How did neither of them had life insurance on them? It's kind of like missed opportunity. Like any, most people in today's society, you guys got insurance policies on each other? Life insurance yeah. policies? No, we don't. In May 2021, Nick Ferkus was arrested. Prosecutors said Nick killed Heidi simply because she was about to find out they were completely broke and they were going to be evicted. Nick lied to everybody, and he feared that if it all came out, that he would be abandoned by everybody, by Heidi, by his family, by his friends, his reputation of this good, old, you know, nice guy, good neighbor, goes to church, helps out with the kids, so many people can look up to, that re reputation would be gone. So he, they said, killed his wife. Yeah. Prosecutors say Nicholas Ferkus shot his wife and made up a story about an intruder. His, his attorneys insist the intruder was real. Prosecutors told the jury that Nicholas Ferkus acted out of shame and fear. They say the home he and his wife Heidi shared was foreclosed and that they were set to be evicted, but that he never informed Heidi. They say Nicholas staged a burglary, killed her and shot himself in the leg. Defense attorneys said Nicholas first heard a noise, grabbed his shotgun, then woke up Heidi. They say the intruder shot Heidi dead before shooting Nicholas. And they insist Heidi was aware of the couple's financial hardships. In January 2023, he went on trial. His defense stuck with his story of an intruder. Someone broke in 13 years before and Heidi was killed. The prosecution said he killed his wife to protect his reputation. There were no signs of an intruder in the house at all that day. Even the marks on the door, that wouldn't have been enough to break in. He said they fought beside the table at the door, but it all looked neat as shit. At the end of a two-week trial, the jury found Nicholas Ferkus guilty of the murder of Heidi Ferkus. Nick was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. For all of us, it is impossible that Nick could ever have done what he is accused of doing. We believe him, and we believe in his innocence. Fergus himself insisted he didn't do it. While I understand the jury's verdict and the sentence you must give, I do maintain and will maintain to my dying breath my innocence of this crime. And that was Nick's plan, concocting this entire plot, brutally murdering the young wife he loved shooting her in the back as she tried to, to run. I mean, you can hear her on the phone. She sounds terrified. The brutal, like, and for what? For what? How can you go and do something like that? I mean, I know he, he did it. The prosecutors say, and you know, because he just loved to spend money and his, he feared his reputation. That could, you can get help for that. You can get help if you're like addicted to spending money. You don't have to, you know, or you can financially recover from it. You don't have to end somebody's life. And then many, well, then he ended his own life. 
13 years later, that's what he did. Because now he'll be spending, he was li sentenced life without parole. He'll be spending the rest of his life staring at grey bars in a jumpsuit till his body gives out. He said he will appeal, but who knows if these will ever go anywhere. Who knows why people do what they do? Everybody looks out their own window. For Nick, though, those windows have goddamn bars on them. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, watching this whole video with me means it means a lot. So thank you. Um, yeah, here, listen. Next video will be out a couple of days. So we'll look forward to that. Um, also, if you want to check out the That Chapter podcast, you can give it a goo wherever you get your podcasts. But until you see me, you hear from me, you yeah, whatever. Take care of each other and yourselves. Please take care of yourselves because I love you. Like it.